Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So um, I had a prank done to me one time. Has anybody here ever been pranked? So the prank that I want to share you happened actually, um, it happened here when I first came back to be Pastor Rob's assistant pastor. I, um, I, was, I was in the office kind of get, feeling my way around, and I, I received this email from one of my family members that he was really, really struggling, and he was struggling with making some very, very bad choices. Cho- he was... Um, he was choosing and struggling with making a choice on, you know, entering into a really bad relationship and leaving the church and serving God and leaving all these things, really struggling. And he was considering leaving his wife and kids. And, and I remember getting this email, and my heart broke. And I remember I was like devastated. I'm carrying this burden. I'm walking around like, oh, I'm so discouraged. And I'm so sad. I'm like, how am I going to address this? What's going to happen? I thought about all the implications and all the dominoes that are, that are going to fall. And, 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 and it was like, I was thinking about my, my um, you know, the relationships and all the battle and, you know, and, and all these things. And then finally, the, you know, somebody, I found out somebody had hacked or had got into his email one of our other family members, and had wrote this message as a prank. I was so mad. I was like, man, I'm going to beat you. I didn't, that's what I said, but that's how I felt, but I didn't do anything like that. I was very Christian about it. But here's, the, here's what I wanted to share with you, because it was really interesting. Because even though I knew that it was a lie, even though I knew that it was a prank, even though I knew that they were trying to mess me up, I still looked at my family member that this whole email was centered around, which it was not, it was not from him. I still kind of was wondering, like, is this guy struggling? So for like two weeks, I'm having a hard time processing, thinking about it one way and looking at him one way and going, dude, man, are you really like struggling? Are you really messing? Or, and, he, and he's looking at me like, why are you looking at me like that? You know, like what's going on? But I had heard this message, and it hit me so hard, and it went down so deep. I knew it was a lie, but it still changed everything. I don't know if you've ever heard about it, but in, there was a, a book or a, a story that was written many, many years ago, and I wanted to share it with you. It, it was, it's the story that we would know as like 1984, but there was an author <clears throat> that... Um, that H.G. Wells wrote, wrote, it's called The War of the Worlds, and what happened was Orson Wells was a producer, he's 23 years old, and what he did is, in, in this random place, in the middle of nowhere, what they did is they got the radio, and back then there was no TV, there was no internet, there weren't any, you know, cell phones or anything like that, so you couldn't watch it, there was no computers, it was just radio and newspaper back then, and so newspaper was how most people were used to getting their information but the radio became like this new technology where people would turn on their radio and they could hear, you know, voices, like a really big deal. So in 1938, what they did is they did this, this drama where they booked out almost an hour of live radio and they said no commercials. And what they did is they did this voice narrative, a dramatization of an alien invasion into America. And so you guys are like, oh my gosh, so goofy. But it sounded so real and so powerful that it shut down entire cities and thousands of soldiers called up saying, how can I enlist? How can I get ready? All these off-duty police officers and off-duty military, they said, where do we go? Tell us where to report. We're ready to fight now. And it shut down everything. And it was absolute chaos. They shut down power grids to entire areas. They said, we want to turn off the electricity so the aliens can't get in. And it was this massive panic and turmoil. And uh, this guy, Orson Welles, he was 23 years old. He was like, oh, I, I didn't really mean to do that. But it became like the, the kickstart for his absolute great career in movies and as a director. He was like a legend. He, you know, basically, he, he like pranked the entire nation. All because he came up with a story that was so believable, and the report that he gave was so powerful, and they basically made it, you know, they, they had a voice that sounded like the president at that time, and they had a voice that sounded like the, the most famous radio announcers. What I want to say today is that you and I, we have good news for the world. 
You have the report in your life that will change the entire world. The Bible calls it the good news or the gospel. And God says, I want this gospel preached. And the Bible says that you and me are the source to, of the good news into this entire world. And if we don't want to bring that good news, the world will be praying for eternity. The world will suffer in the bad news for eternity. The world will miss out on all that God has for them only because they don't have the good news. The Bible says, I want to read a couple of verses, and I'm going to jump around in these two. Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 Another translation says 70, others and sent them on ahead of him. Jesus sent 70 of his messengers out ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Numbers chapter 13 Verse 1 and 2, they are on the threshold to the promised land. Three million people that have been delivered from Egypt are on the border, about to enter into the promised land, and this is what the Lord speaks to Moses. Verse 2, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From every tribe, or each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. You and I are the source of of the good news. God wants us to give the good news to this world. I want to just begin real quick. God moves with good news. You know, God moves when there's good news. The Bible says that Jesus sent his disciples ahead of him, telling them to bring the good news that Jesus is coming. The spies were sent into Canaan, and they were asked to give a report when they came back and take a look at the land and tell the people what you see. Let me just say this. You and I are the source of good news to the world. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news to the whole creation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, this gospel, good news of the kingdom, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The, the Bible says that word end means the goal, the full purpose of God will be accomplished. You know, people will not experience God's plan in their life until somebody brings them the good news. So some of you here have not experienced God yet because somebody hasn't given you any good news. There are people that you see on a daily basis that are missing God's end or God's destiny, God's purpose for their life because nobody, even though you go to school with them, even though you go to work with them, even though you ride the bus with them, nobody's told them how good God has a plan for their life. You know, there's good news out there. That might be a shock, but there is good news. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Daniel 12, 3, our text, it says, those who turn many from darkness. Numbers 13, the Bible says that Moses was called by God to send out these spies, and the word that's used for these chiefs is the word ab. I used that word the other night when I was talking about my dad. What it means is source, or like a spring. This is where it comes from. This is, ab means like if you were to go and you're in a wilderness and there's a well and there's water flowing up, that's the source of the water that turns into a river, that turns into an ocean. It comes from this little source and it means source or ancestor, the head, the leader, the originator. This is leadership. This is influence. This is what it's talking about here. And these guys, God says, these are the sources that are going to affect All of the land, there's one source over every tribe. There's 12 tribes of Israel, 3 million people all together. And these are the guys that are going to give the message to all of them. These are guys that are expected to spy out the land. They have revelation. They have vision. They are familiar with what God has done. They were there when the 10 plagues took place. They were there walking across the Red Sea. They were there at Mount Sinai and they saw the lightning. They knew who God was. They were there with the cloud and the fire. They had seen miracles. And yet here they are and God says, I want you to send these 12 guys. These are the source. And they are gonna go beyond with personal danger, risk into like hostile territory to see what others can't 
to see beyond, to see what, you know, what, what is going to take place. These are the men with vision, with revelation. And so what they're expecting to see are giants. They're expecting to see the enemy. They're expecting to see the weaknesses of the enemy. They're expecting to see the difficulties and the opportunities. They're expected to see the miracles, the, man, the land of milk and honey, the grapes of incredible size. There was a grape cluster they said was so big that one person couldn't hold it. You know when you have grapes in your lunch? We can fit them in Ziplocs. This land was so, like, prosperous that they took one cluster of grapes and they had to hold a, a staff between them. Men, these are solid men. And they put it on a, they're like, this is how incredible this land is. This is the promised land. This is the dream. This is the legend. This is the hall of fame. This is what we've dreamed about. We've got here on the edge. And they're going in, they're checking it out and they're inspecting the land. The Bible says, what did they see? They go into the promised land, and what did they see? In verse 23 of Numbers 13, it says, They came to the valley of Eshcol, cut down there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. And they brought some pomegranates and figs, and that place was called the Valley of Eshcol because the cluster the people of Israel cut down from there. They named it. They're like, that's the massive grape land. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. They came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is his fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And we saw the descendants of Anak there. Those are giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. That's the report. Now they're giving their opinion. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. It's like, we can do this. God is here. God has given it to us. Verse 31, then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than us. Fact. They brought the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that eats or devours its inhabitants. And the people we saw in it of great height. We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Their conclusion was that we're not able to do it. This is a land that eats people. We seem like grasshoppers to them. How, how did they know what the people of the land thought of them? Did they go to the people in the land and say, hey, man, how do I appear to you? As a grasshopper. Oh, you think of me as, oh, I feel terrible. Tell me what you think of me. I, how do they know what the people of the land thought of them? Say, you look like a grass. No, they didn't ask. They just kind of imagined, creative. You know, we, we can create some pretty interesting stories in our head. Some of us have created a pretty radical narrative of how things work in your head, of how the enemy sees you and how this world sees you and how we're, you know, we're this intimidated and, and how small and how weak and how nothing we are. You know, God, Bible says that God has created man in his own image. And how did God create the world as he imagined it and he spoke it into existence? And what do we do? In our own mind, in our own imagination, we create words and it becomes our reality. Numbers 14, the Bible says, all the congregation raised up a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, I wish we died in the land of Egypt or died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones become prey. We should just go back to Egypt. And they said, let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. Let's go back to slavery. Because they heard one bad report. They were on the threshold of the promise. The land of ice cream, as Pastor Rob. This is the ma ma grapes. This is the victory that God has. They're right on the edge. And one bad report turns them around. 
What did they see? What did they say? They said, there's much land, but it's all right. It's hard. It's too big. It's too hard. I'm not really into the work. It's not really worth the struggle. I worked really hard as a slave. I worked really hard traveling across the wilderness. I just, it's not worth the struggle. I've been through the struggle. I don't want to struggle again. I'd rather just go back to slavery. You know, there's a choice that we're going to have to make with what we see. I'll never forget the story of, there was a lady in our church, Jerry, Jerry Coons, who confronted my dad and my grandpa one Christmas, and this is when I was very little. She had just got back from a trip, I believe, to Seattle, and she said, you got to buy stock in this new company. It's going to be huge. And Jerry was not a financial person. She was not an investor. She had nothing to do with stocks, but she was in exhorting my dad and my grandfather, rebuking them to buy stock in this new company. She says, they're just about to go on the stock market. This is the first time the stocks are super cheap. If you buy them, they will make money. And my dad and my grandpa were like, nah, you know, they had a choice. Should we believe the report of this wild lady, Jerry? She didn't know stocks, but she did know coffee. Because that was the first offering of Starbucks. One dollar would have been millions today. <laughs> oh, I wish I had my 10-year-old little mind would have been like, pow, you know, here's my, here's my baseball card money. But, you know, here's what happens. Here's these guys. They are the source. They are the cause. They are the, the purpose. And they say, yeah, it's a beautiful land, but let's be real. Let's talk real. Let's be honest. You don't really know my family. You don't really know my circumstances. You don't know how much I've been through. You don't know the scars on my back. You don't know the scars on my feet. I'm tired, man. I've been there. I've been through the struggles. It's my time to chill. Somebody else can go in. I don't really want to deal with the giants. I don't really want to go in. But here's the real choice. What's more real? God's promises, God's word, or the intimidation and the bad report of this world? What's more real, the gospel or the bad news? Wait, wait, did I just say that? The gospel or the news? So let's preach the gospel. Come on, folks. Let's choose the gospel. What's more real? Romans chapter 10, verse 8, the word is as close as our, our mouth and our heart. The Bible says in verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart that the word sh- of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You are just one good report away from salvation. One good report that you receive from experiencing God in your life. There are people out there in this world your neighbors, your coworkers, they're just one good report away from life-changing salvation. Our world is one good report away from Jesus. Or one bad report away from 40 years in the wilderness. You know, bad reports aren't our job. Bad reports on our job. There's no word in the Bible for bad report. It's not like gospel is good news. There's no like bad news, bad report. That's not our job. Your job is not to bring the bad report. We don't need to talk about how bad things are getting. That's not what God calls us to do. It's real. There were giants there. There were enemies of God there. There were really big demonic people. The Nephilim were like supernatural giants. But that wasn't their job. That's not what they were called to do. God didn't say, hey, go bring a bad report back. You know, the 10 chiefs attitudes, I wish we'd all died. All of a sudden, they become suicidal. Hopelessness, doubt, depression, disobedience, rebellion against God. I wonder if that's because the sources in our life are bringing the bad report and not the good report. The 10 chiefs attitudes cause people to want to return to slavery, want to return to bondage, want to return to the old life. That was convicting to me. 
as a leader. I wonder if I've ever said anything that would cause somebody to want to return to hopelessness, want to return to their bad life. If the bad news that comes out of my mouth causes people to say, you know what, I don't want to serve God anymore. God brought them all the way from Egypt. They've seen the miracles, and all they are is one good message away. And the words affected millions, three million people, entire families, 40 years. I want you to consider the source today. You know, when we were in Guatemala years ago, I went with uh, Brother Connor to go visit Pastor Mike and Diana and their family. It was a wonderful time, and the food was amazing. But all the food that they gave us was inspected or purified by them. And about halfway through, we were enjoying life. We were having fun. We were getting, actually gaining weight. We were enjoying the food there. And all of a sudden, something was given to us. And the question was, was where did it come from? And so Pastor Mike asked, oh, yeah, it's a very good source. This is a good, clean source. This is a very safe source. We ate the food. And that night, Connor and I both had both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> it was like really bad. I remember thinking, I'm going to die. I lost 10 pounds that day. I had the most shredded abs. I'm telling you, involuntary weight loss, man, you can get there. It was like I, my abs had abs. <clears throat> For the rest of the trip, I fasted just water, man. It was just great. I came back lean and mean, man. But the thing was is that one time, one bad source changed everything. How it's processed, how the words are processed, how the report, how the news is processed in your life, is it accurate or inaccurate? It, it's up to the sources. You know, 40 days of spying, that's 40 days alone with their thoughts, alone with their hearts, no accountability, no church. That's why you got to come to church. Your mind will take you places, and you'll hear words. You'll see things, and you won't see them correctly. 40 days on their own. No accountability. No wife to tell them, what are you talking about? What are you listening to? What are you doing? They're alone. They can play all the games on their phone. They can watch all the football games. They can, they can do anything they want. They can go down every rabbit trail. Nobody putting them in check. No access to pastor to kick their butts. Where do their minds go? Where do their hearts go? They didn't just all of a sudden become bad spies. It was deep inside of them. The Bible says, out of our hearts, the mouth speaks. You don't bring bad news automatically. It's out of your heart. Out of the abundance of our hearts, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. The fight for perspective is the greatest battle. How to see. How to see. We heard about this last night. How to see our circumstances. How to see our trials. How to see God's next step. To see God's pain. To see what God cares about. To see the future. To see God's future. God's destiny. The fight for good happens in their attitude, in their view, in their words. How they saw was their view of God. Caleb says in Numbers 14, verse 8, he says, God delights in us. It's already sure. God delights in you. We're going to win. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how bad the problems are. It doesn't matter what the bad report is. God likes us. We're going to win. Hey, let me say something. God likes you. You will win. I don't care what this world says. I don't care what you heard. I don't care what somebody said to you. And I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it again. God loves you, and he delights in you, and you are going to win. You are a winner in Jesus' name. But the Bible says if the eye is evil, the whole body's dark. We are the source for others. That's why we're here. Our friends, our family, our cities, our nations are waiting, and the source comes from our heart. Let's consider the source. It's a reflection of our words. You know, when I went to Hawaii to visit my little brother, Nate, we looked out into the ocean at a surf spot we were going to surf, and all of a sudden there's these birds floating around, and under, in, in the water, right under the birds, there's all this churning water. Something's down there. They call that a bird pile. When you see a bird pile, they say, don't go in the water. Because something's pushing the fish up, and the birds are coming down, and the pile of birds are spinning around. So you know there's something down there, and you just have to watch from a distance. I went to a really fancy, a famous surf spot. It's very exclusive, locals only. 
And we were about to go into the water, and a guy comes up to me, and he's like, hey, you know, I just, I just heard from my friend that there's a couple of sharks out there. Somebody saw a couple of sharks. I don't know if he was telling the truth. But I didn't go out. The bad report kept me from the water. When I went to visit my, my son Marcus in Long Island just a couple of months ago, we went to the edge of Montauk. It's the edge of Long Island. It's like the farthest part out there. And as we're there visiting the lighthouse, there's 60 surfers. I'm looking at three or four different surf spots. Guys are out there surfing real big waves. But I had zero temptation. Why? Because I went into the lighthouse little like viewing area, and it said, Montauk Lighthouse Peninsula is a breeding ground for a variety of different sharks. <laughs> I was like, those waves look great. They're all yours. One bad report. Now, I'm a surfer. I love surfing. I was looking for surf. When I saw that, all of a sudden, my surf yeah. is gone. The vision is reflected in your words. Your words. Everything you know, do is reflected in your words. Guard your heart. It's the source of life. Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 10 and verse 11, the mouth of a righteous person is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The more you focus on something, the more it shows up in your life. You know, complaining shows what you're focused on. The dark, the negative, the frustrating. Focus on what you don't want. Focus on what you don't like and what you don't have. Complaining reveals your heart. You, can't be com you cannot complain and be creative at the same time. You cannot complain and have vision at the same time. You cannot complain and grow at the same time. You can't be a complainer and ever grow. So if complaining is coming out, if complaining is rolling around in here, just so you know, you're stagnant. You're not growing. You're go it's going dark. You're not healthy. You're not thriving. You're shriveling. Let me say this, you cannot be stressed and thankful at the same time. If you have anxiety, you cannot have, be anxious and thankful at the same time. So one of the cures for anxiety is to just write down or speak your gratitudes. That's what the Bible says. So if you ever feel stressed, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you think your spouse in, or wants to be married to a frowner or a complainer? or a bad news giver? Do you think your friends want to hang out with a complainer or you know, a gossip, someone that's focusing on the negative? Do you think your kids want to look up to someone whose life is always a bummer? Caleb quieted the people. He's the chief, the ob, the source. He says, shut your mouth, guys. Shut it. And done. No, no, no. That's unnecessary. Isn't it interesting that this is the guy who survived 40 more years and he was 80 years old, and he says, I'm just as strong as I was when I was a kid. The gospel makes you strong. The gospel gives you the fountain of youth. You want to look good when you're 85 years old? Start talking about good news. Be grateful. Start talking about God. Talk, start preaching the gospel. He says, I don't care about all that other stuff, Caleb says. It's only what God told us to do. He said, let us go. Let us go up at once. Let's go now and occupy it because God has given it. We are well able to overcome the gospel. We are well able to take this land. So ask your friends, ask your family, what's coming out of your mouth? Because your words tell you who you are. Out of your heart, your mouth speaks. So ask somebody who's honest with you. What do you think? And they're like, uh, I got to work on that one. So how do we influence the source? My biggest surf contest ever, it was on TV. I was really intimidated. There was hundreds of surfers, pro guys. I was sick to my stomach, and I, I almost pulled myself out. I almost took my entry out of the, the contest. It was early in the morning, and I'm like, nobody will ever know that I was here. I'll just get out of here. The words that were going on in my heart and my mind, this is, you know, I was probably 20 years old, were so dark. And this pro surfer came up to me, and he's like, hey, what's up, Josh? I was like, what's up, bro? And he's like, dude, you're as good as any of these guys out here. I, how did I know? How did he know that that's what I needed? He said, you're as good as anybody out here. You could win this thing. 
Let's go, baby. Let's go. So in one word of good news, everything changed. And guess what? I was, I would have went, I was in first place, and I slipped on the wave of the day. I was, I was one wave away from winning. I got third place in that, out of like 150. It was pretty cool. And it sh- but it, I, just, I, I shared that story because one good news will change your life. The first time I preached, I remember I was right there. I was sick to my stomach. I thought I was going to puke. And I'm like, what am I doing right now? And Pastor Summer walks up to me and he goes, hey, Josh, don't worry. God won't let you mess up what he wants to speak to his people. You're going to be fine. Yeah, that's a good point. I can blow it and God will turn it to good. God works all things together for good. How do you change the source? Here's a few Scripture's a few thoughts that I, I want. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. The first thing that we have to do to change the source of what comes in our hearts and comes out is you got to believe in Jesus. It's not positive thinking. I mean, it's positive thinking because of Jesus. But, you know, you can try really hard, but there's a lot of messages. The first thing we have to do is believe in Jesus. Hebrews 5, verse 9 says that Jesus is the source of eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus is the source and the perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the source, the founder, the originator. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, may God, the first source of hope, fill you with joy and peace. You got to believe in Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, he is the source of comfort. He is the father of compassion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says the cross is the power to those being saved. When you think of that Jesus died on the cross, you know, Caleb, in that moment of good report, he thought, you know what? I remember putting the blood on the doorposts. I I remember putting the blood, the blood on the cross. And all of our enemies in one night passed away. All we did is stay in our houses and sleep. That same God who delivered us from slavery, he could do it again. He could do it again. And he could do it through you. And he could do it through you. He could do it through you. We are well able. God is for us. The same God, the Bible says, to read the word. You want to change the source, read your Bible. Revelations 3.14 says, the words of the amen. He is the beginning and the end. He has it all. He knows it all. He knows every situation, every circumstance. How much do we read our Bible? I just want to tell you, if you want to change the source of what comes out of your mouth, just read your Bible. And if it doesn't change, read it more. And if it doesn't change, read it more. And if you keep reading, good stuff's going to start coming out. It's the gospel. It's the good news. You're going to have to pray. The Bible says that he who speaks in tongues edifies himself. You need to get stronger and start speaking in tongues. The interpretation of that word, I love speaking in tongues. (laughs) Jeff Roper said, God doesn't take you anywhere. He hasn't first taken you in prayer. You're not going to the promised land until you've prayed there first. Surrender. Surrender changes the source. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the natural takes on supernatural when it is sown. The natural enters into the supernatural when it's sown. When you die to yourself, when you surrender to experience the kingdom of God, you have to lay down your life, your fears, your doubts, and enter in. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. The final thing that I want to say to become a source or to change the source is to be a source for others. Proverbs 11.25 says, he that waters will himself be watered. You want something to flow into your life, you got to flow out of your life. We're all worried about what we can get. Let's worry about what we can give. The Bible says when Jesus sent out his disciples, they got filled. Because miracles are only a good report away. We had a house in Utah, and one day there was, a, there was an issue where 
we had our, it seemed like everybody was fighting and angry at each other. They were like conflict and it was nasty. And this isn't right. And we were like, you know, we need Jesus here in our house. Something's wrong. And at the same time, there was like this cluster of flies. It was like flying in the middle, like weird flies. Where are they coming in? We had all the windows. This is strange. And we're like, what's going on? And so, so somebody said, we need Jesus. We need to pray. And we need to pray. We need to get God. So we all got together. We were arguing and fighting. Everybody's there and like irritated. And we're like, let's pray. And then somebody said, well, let's check and see if there's something that's in the house that's not right. So we went into our basement. And we found this box that somebody had left there. Somebody had stayed with us for a few days. They had left there, and it was full of, like, demonic books, like witchcraft, how to cast spells, and how to, like, manipulate people, how to, you know. And we're like, we repented. We asked for forgiveness. We got rid of the books, and immediately the flies were gone. And nobody fought anymore. It was incredible. The source of darkness was, had to be removed. And all of a sudden, the good news came in because somebody said, we need to pray, and we need to get a hold of God. The Bible says that when Jesus went around, he saw the crowds and he had compassion. His heart broke for them because they were harassed and helpless. And they were like sheep without a, a, you know, without a shepherd. He said, pray that there's somebody that goes and tells them the good news. In Luke chapter 9, the Bible says he got the 12 together and he gave them power. And he sent them out to preach the good news. And they departed and went to all the villages. And in our text in Luke chapter 10, the Bible says he appointed not just 12 this time, but 70. And he said, before I go, before I go into these cities, I want you to go bring good news. Because when you bring the good news, I'm going to come into that city and it's going to be amazing. And the Bible says the 72 returned with, with joy. In Luke chapter 10, 17, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you. But don't even just rejoice in this. But just rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, the 10 bad spies, their names are written in the word of God as the bad report. We sing songs about them. And Jesus said, your names are forever remembered as those who brought the good news. Forever in heaven, you are the one that changed society, that changed the world because you brought good news. He said, rejoice. You will forever be remembered as the bringers of good news. You know, it's interesting that 12 and 70 of the numbers that Jesus used, the Bible says when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, the waters opened, they came to the waters they came to the place of Meribah, which is bitterness. They started complaining. And they grumbled against the Lord. And Moses stopped them and said, you know, God's going to provide for them. And he prayed, and there were 12 springs, 12 sources of life. It says there were 12 springs, and there were 70 palm trees. You know, palm trees is a picture of a man or woman of God. The Bible says he was planted by the water, Right? Palm trees bend, but they don't break. Palm trees can get pushed around. The storms can blow. The hurricanes can go. And they can bend. Boom, they're back. And God's trying to tell us something, that he needs people to be trees planted by the water, by the source, that get refreshed, that they can bend, but they're still here. They can bend, but they're not going to break. That they can go, and it's, whoa, this is bad news. Man. The storm is blowing. Oh, it's really tough. But we're back. God is good. God has a water for us. God has a spring for us. God wants us to be those that bring good news. What about you, source? What about you, chief? Fathers, leaders, pastors, men and women of God, where's the news that's coming out of your life? Is everything dark or is, are we going to be the ones that bring good news to this world? Rejoice because your reputation, salvation comes. I want to close. <clears throat> What's the message of your life? Been there, done that, I tried and failed. Too many giants, too many hard. I'm intimidated. It's time to enjoy life. What are the words out of our mouth? Complaining, whining, excuses. I'm entitled to a little chill. I'm expecting there to be no struggle. Maybe you become critical. What's the report of your lives? What's the report you give at home, around your table? Because the gospel precedes the kingdom of God. The good news precedes God's move. The good report brings Jesus next. Every man, every woman, every child, you are the source, the connection. Your report will change the world. Your report brings Jesus. It might have been better, 
But today is the day of salvation. Jesus is alive. Where sin abounds, if this is the darkest the world's ever been, we get to see more grace abound. If the darkness is thick, the light shines that much brighter. The world still needs God's people who will be the source, who will bend and won't break. God is for us. He's going to do it again. I have a testimony. I have a friend that I had been praying for for 30 years, and I saw him at the beach randomly. He was discouraged. He was upset. There was dark pain, injuries. He had bodily injuries, physical injuries, emotional hurt. His marriage was struggling. And he was really, he, he told me later, he's like, I was on the edge. I was thinking thoughts that I shouldn't be thinking. And I remember I said to him this one day in passing, and there were a bunch of guys around, and I just finally got a word, and I said, hey, I just want to tell you, hey, bro, there's more to life, and you know where I stand. There's more to life than just surfing. There's more to life than just this little, this little, God has big plans for your life. And then I got interrupted in another guy's. He came to me later and he said, man, when you said that to me, it changed my life. And he started praying and God brought, met him and he got saved. And now that guy is witnessing to everyone he's around, almost annoyingly. He's bringing the gospel. He's like, I got a word for you, and I got a word for you, and I'm going to pray for you. And he's like, let's do a Bible study, and let's do a Bible study, let's do a Bible study. And this guy got saved. All it took was one good report. Let's bring the gospel. Consider the source. Thank you. That's all I have.